Welcome everyone to the third part of this tutorial on slumbush encroachment mapping in South Africa. I will first give an overview of the uh, dependencies you need uh, to install or, ha or have on your device prior to starting um, the R tutorial. Uh, we need R. Um, the best case is the latest um, version of it. It's uh, 4.1.2. Um, and uh, we need an IDE. For example, RStudio. We will use RStudio because it's uh, native to R and really good inter integrated in R. Um, a third, we need uh, QGIS in the end of that session. It's um, it's optional, mm, yet it's easy to uh, for visual visualizing the maps afterwards. We need some R packages, uh, starting with uh, Tidyverse, um, Data Table, Terra, and so on, and these MLR three packages. Later in the tutorial, I will um, talk about uh, these different packages and why we need them. Our packages are um, simply said um, a, a box containing code that make up um, your toolbox for doing analyses in R. Down here, uh, we have linked uh, to the R primers, if you're new, new to R, to the, for example, iteration web page, I recommend to take prior to um, doing this tutorial. In the end of this tutorial, we will pr produce these maps. Uh, we can see here um, a Slangbosch probability map from three years, 2015 to 2017, um, showing the dynamics of bush cover change in that area. Further, uh, we will show how to create indices for um, showing these results in a single map. I've now opened R, R Studio, and we are now in the first of the three scripts I've provided for you. First one is called modeling, and that's where we uh, do a step-by-step -step guideline how to model with MLR3. At first, uh, I've defined some uh, packages uh, we need for this tutorial, mm, and um, that's it's the way to install them is by uncommenting these lines install packages. I've already installed them, that's why we won't do that now. But for all the others, uh, we need to we need to have these packages installed in the R environment. By um, this function, we will load all the packages defined up here in the current uh, R environment. Uh, down here, we can see uh, all, them all loading. We can check um, that everything is correct by typing the all, um, meaning to um, check if all the uh, the loading uh, worked. Alternatively, you can load the packages manually by library, um, by the library command. That's the traditional way. Uh, we use the tidyverse, that's a convenient uh, library for data handling using so-called verbs that makes it really easy to wrangle uh, data from different shapes and different formats in uh, whatever we need. Um, the second library is Rasta, but um, I've discarded Rasta recently um, because it has been succeeded by Terra. It's they are um, yeah um, subsequent packages, so we are only using Terra today. And Terra is much faster than Rasta; it has some other priorities. Use SF for uh, vector handling, for example, point data or polygon data. We've already um, provided for this course. We use MLR3, as I've already mentioned. Uh, this is the base package for MLR. Uh, we need the MLR3 spatial temporal uh, package that enables uh, a validation approach for um, suited for spatial data. Um, we need the learners package where random forest is integrated and some others. To compare random forest, we use a k nearest neighbor classifier. 
so we have two different results. Uh, we can we can see how the different algorithms work and what predictions they produce. Here we define the base path of this tutorial, which is just where we are now. Um, so uh, that's where we, you've downloaded this package. You do not need to change that unless you transfer the data to another location on your disk. Otherwise, this is really fine. These are the, the path we need later for um, loading and writing all the data. So we mm, put it now into our, our environment. This command, the source command, uh, is used to load another script I've provided for you. It's the helper script where these paths are already provided. So for the other scripts, we just need to type in the source um, helper R and we are aware of these path variables and other functions I've, I've, I've defined before. This line here is just for creating these paths. Um, you just need to run it once, otherwise it will just output that this path has already been created. In the next section, we will import the satellite data we use for this tutorial. It's Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data. We use the uh, VH Sentinel-1 channel and the SAVI index from the Sentinel-2 data. And for both sensors, uh, we use um, the whole timeline between uh, for, for each year we model. So for 2015 uh, only for 2015 and um, for, for the following years only the data for the specific year. Now we search for this data on the disk. In this variable, we've stored now the path to that data set. It's an NV stack. Here we import the layer names of that stack because they are not included into the file uh, itself. By looking into um, these layer names, we see the beginning of that stack. It starts with uh, Savi, the Sentinel-2 index, in February 2016 and uh, goes up until the September, but there are more variables in, in, inside of that stack containing the Sentinel-1 data as well. Now we import the dataset itself, stored here in this path, by using the terra um, command rust. The stack now looks like that. We have um, this raster class, um, has um, 175 pixels in x and epsilon dimensions and 26 layers, meaning the time steps and the different indices we use. It has a resolution of 30 by 30 meters and this um, coordinate extend. In this whole story, we use uh, the UTM zone 35 um, south for the whole analysis that is suited for this South African area. We can plot uh, this data. For example, the first data set looks like this and a central one VH image looks like this. In the next section, uh, I will show you how to import vector files. Previous, um, in the next section, I will show you how to import vector files. I've uh, already mapped some areas here. Uh, I will show you quickly in, in QGIS. Uh, these are our training data. And these are different land cover types I've validated with Google Earth imagery, um, especially containing that Slangbosch area here. We use as um, yeah, the target variable, the variable we want to model for, for the whole area. Getting back to R. We can use the read sf command from the sf package to, to load that data. 
For you, it should be in the same file system as I've introduced before. It's called samples. We can use the command exact extract to index uh, the pixels in the data stack, which overlay with the polygons we've previously imported. So we get all the data um, contained in this big raster cube, now only in these areas where our training data is. We need that for um, training our model on that. So we discard all the data that is in the in the raster stack uh, we don't need or we don't have a label for right now. We will shortly have a look into this um, training data. In the output, output we can see different classes. Um, we've already seen in QGIS, the grassland class, water and forest, and also this slungbush area. That's the only one labeled as true for Slung, whether slungbosch occurred or not. I've chosen an, a plot that uh, is covered with slungbosch throughout all three years. So for all models, we can be sure that we actually see slungbosch and not um, some other grass or, or whatever area. This is the output when we look on the first the first row on the extracted data. So this is now satellite data. It's a bit messy, but we see the first pixel we have here is uh, not a slungbush area. It's from the grassland and has um, different val values throughout time and throughout sensor. And uh, has two coordinates. That's really important here. We included getting the coordinates in this command here. These are again all the variables we have. Now we can look on the dimensionality. It's um, 638 pixels and uh, 31 variables now in our data set. We filter that only pixels that are covering more than 0.5% uh, with a polygon we use. So we can be actually sure that we see the land cover we labeled before. In this line, we transfer this data. Now it's still a data frame, a really basic um, uh, class in R for storing tables to an SF class, so a spatial vector class, uh, where the coordinates are stored in the background and we can use it for, um, for example, plotting or MLR3 uses the coordinates for um, registering the data set as spatial data set. This line is only good for transferring the two um, labels, the class label and the slangwash label, to factorial variables. That's R specific and sometimes really important if we need um, a categorical data, uh, a categorical variable that is not an, um, a string. Let's quickly look on the data we have using ggplot. In the plots pane now we see the x and epsilon uh, variables and the slangbosch areas. This pretty resembles what we see in QGIS. Now we can decide whether to use the, the data set where we provide um, binary information. So slangbosch yes or no. This is the different colors here. Or if you want to do uh, a real land cover classification. So if we want to model for these other classes as well. For this tutorial, um, we reduce it to these two classes, slumbush and no slumbush. So we have only the two colors. That's why we uh, discard the class variable now so that we don't use it for the modeling. Otherwise the algorithm thinks that the class variable is also important for modeling and it will um, corrupt the whole analysis. That's why we need to discard it here. This line here can be used if you want to perform multi-class analyses with the land cover I've just mentioned before.
We now come to the MLR3 sections. First, we define a task. A task is containing all the um, necessary information the algorithm needs for the model. Uh, for example, the ID. So we give this all an, a name. We give the backend data we've uh, assigned before this land cover binary, and we define a target variable, in this case, the slung wash variable. We can see, still see here on the right side, we want to model for this slung wash class. Now we define a learner. A learner is the actual classification algorithm. Um, in this tutorial, we test for two different learners. The first one is random forest, uh, abbreviated by RF, and the second one is the k-nearest neighbor. Um, classifier called uh, KNN. Here is the original package where this method has been implemented. It's from Ranger and the other one is from, from KKNN. To integrate a learner, you um, give the name of the learner. In the MLR3 help page, we can find all the different classification algorithms. So we, um, we can type in the learner we want. We need to put in what we want to predict. It's either probability or only the response. Probability means we also want to know how, how likely it was that um, a certain response uh, was found. And response only means we have uh, yes or no decisions. The last variable importance is, um, is set to permutation. We need that later for assessing the importance of uh, the layers in the model. So we define these two learners and we found the now as environment variables. For the learners we've declared here, we need uh, to set some hyperparameters. We do this in step three. For random forest, um, it is common to take the square root uh, of the number, number of variables in the model. Uh, we can see how many variables uh, there are. It's 71. We take the square root and use uh, just the, the upper value of that. So we round it up. So this takes, this gives six uh, for the mtri variable. That means there are the size of, of split options per tree. It's quite complex. Uh, you can look up um, uh, some videos uh, on YouTube on, on how to interpret these hyperparameters. Uh, the number of trees is set to 300, which is known to be a quite robust estimate. Now we set these hyperparameters in this call and also for the K and N model. Here, a K of nine was taken. This choice, this choice was quite arbitrary, um, and if you want, you can choose, uh, you can, you can change this uh, k uh, in the way you want. Now, in the next section, we actually train the model with this call. So we train the random forest model on the on the data. So this is the task variable we have from above, containing all the data, so all variables. What we want to do, we want to do a two-class binary analysis and on the slung wash variable. The other coordinates we've, we've given. After we've fitted uh, the learner to our tasks, to our data, we now want to predict on the whole data set, so on the complete geographic extent. I've provided a function for you that takes uh, different arguments, so the task and the model and where the new data is stored and the output file. So you can run this function uh, with all the data you, you need. Um, this contains the prediction of the new data and the due ref referencing of the results and saving on the disk. It's not much more. So we load the function now. The function is a variable as everything else now. So we can see it here in functions. It's the predict and save function. Right now, MLR3 needs to have the new data in a data frame or a data table. 
That means we have to coerce all the data, so transform the data from a raster data set to a table, basically. This involves loading it to memory. So if you want to use different data, at this point, uh, the computer needs a lot of uh, memory storage. With this example data set, uh, we don't need much. That's why also this step is really quick, quickly done. Now we have all this um, spatial temporal data set. So the, um, the satellite imagery we have loaded as a table. Uh, you already know these variables. Um, we can see the different values for each pixel now. In this line, we define the output file for the random forest and the KNN model. And now we just simply call the predict and save function I've defined before. This takes a second. The prediction is now saved to these uh, variables. So we can assess it right now, but also it is saved to disk. That's why we've um, declared a out file um, variable here. In the next section, we visualize our data. So at first, we see what is inside this prediction. On the right-hand side, we see that it's three layers, basically. It's on the top left, the response, the binary response. So whether slangwash or not occurred on that area in this year. And the other um, images show at first uh, the probability that there's no slangwash. And in the uh, bottom left, we see the probability that we have slangwash. Now we can plot the KNN and the random forest classifier next to each other. Differences between the classifiers are apparent. We see that random forest uh, provides, provides much um, sharper edges and the KNN has more scattered uh, results. But still we cannot quantify um, which algorithm is better or not, we can just interpret it visually. These plots now show the random forest and KNN classifiers probability for slumbush occurrence. Uh, we can see the differences in the two algorithms as, as well. Now we want to validate this approach. This has been done by splitting the data into training test sets and repeatedly fit the model on this data on changing training data sets and changing test sets. We do this via repeated spatial cross validation. This is an approach where um, the subsets are not chosen randomly, but chosen by um, subsets in space. In now we can see the how this algorithm splits our data set in different test sets. For example, in the first repetition of our validation, only the red area, this area, is used as test sets, and all the rest is used for training the data. So we can be sure um, that the data was chosen independently. Here we can see different lines, which pixels have been actually used, if you want to get more into detail here. We compare this to a simple cross-validation, not spatial cross-validation, uh, where the pixels are just chosen by random. This looks like that. Here we can see the cross-validation that is non-spatial. That means the training and test sets have been chosen just by uh, yeah, by random um, choice.
we do the same for the KNN model. And now in this section, we actually perform the resampling, it's called the validation. So this resamples um, training and test sets as many times as we've defined beforehand. We've defined 10 false, 10 repeats, means uh, we um, repeat all the approach 10 times on 10 different subset subsets of training and test. So uh, 10 times 10, 100 times for each algorithm. This now takes a while and maybe your computer um, is getting to the limits. If this process takes too long for you, you can always reduce the number of repeats and fulls uh, I've defined up here to adjust it to your computer. Using uh, the measure, um, as in the MLR3 quick start we've shown before, we use the accuracy. Mm. Using uh, the simple non-spatial cross-validation, we reach an accuracy of 99.4%. Yet this is a biased estimate because for spatial phenomena, uh, it is uh, not liable to use pixels um, right next to uh, the one you want to predict or want to validate because of the spatial so-called spatial autocorrelation. If you want to know more about spatial autocorrelation, uh, you can refer to Brenning et al. 2012. Um, so you uh, know why we use spatial cross-validation here to have an unbiased estimate. The spatial cross-validation uh, has an output of uh, 93.2%. It is uh, far worse than the non-spatial cross-validation, but it is um, more suited for the data we have. We can go into the first lines of the, the scores, so the ten, first 10 repetitions. We can assess how these performed. We can see that lots of them performed really well. So the error, this is the error, not the accuracy, but they are basically the same, but just one minus the error is the accuracy. We see that a lot of models have 100% accuracy or zero error, but some ha have some error. This is a problem of the data set we have. If you have more scattered data, uh, you are likely uh, not achieve 100% accuracy in some repeats, um, but have a more stable estimate. It's, it's part of this data set so that we have a little bit um, um, high variance in the, in the result. The KNN has uh, also a really good estimate, um, but um, this uh, KNN, for example, is really bad in transferring the data to a new data set. Uh, that's why we can see uh, it on the maps that KNN has these more scattered outputs and um, show some um, errors. After we've assessed the accuracy of our model, it is sometimes really um, interesting to know why a certain model fits like that or which variables have been important for the model. That's why in this step we use uh, the MLR3 filtering algorithms to see what uh, features, so which dates and which layers, which satellite data was actually important for the model. Here we fit a, a filtering um, variable. Now we calculate the, the performance of the different variables and store it back into this filter variable. To look into these results, we uh, use, uh, we transfer it to a data table. And we can plot it using the MLR three autoplot functions. On the right hand side, we see now which layers have been important for the model. Um, when we use all the data we have, and not splitting into test and, and and training set, but using all data, we see that the central one VH is the most important layer in the model. So explaining the highest deviance of of the 
phenomenon, slangbush, non-slangbush. And it is uh, in the February, so in the southern hemisphere summer, as well as the second layer. It's a Sentinel-2 based index in, in March. Sometimes we want to visualize that differently. We can extract the dates from these layers and the layer identity and which can show it on a on a timeline so the most important layer was this vh in march and this uh sentinel 2 based index and now we see different importances here but note that if uh, these um the layers are close to each other the importance may be leveraged because the same data is shown in the next one right after or in the one before. Also, maybe that's why the March uh, acquisition was has the highest importance because there's no data around that. But this is still that's interpretation. This has been the first part of the um, practical session. In the next one, we will look into how to automatize uh, this whole procedure to do training and prediction for the other two years and produce change maps.